and NASCAR are looking at varying different options to um, to to solve some of those problems. In 2019, <clears throat> they're going to do away with the restrictor plate. Um, I think it's a good test that they're going to do away with the restrictor plate. I think that the restrictor plate is long. We've been using the restrictor plate for nearly 30 years. Um, I think it's time that, you know, they experiment in other ways to uh, cut the horsepower on the motors without using restrictor plates because of the throttle response. Um, there literally is no throttle response, and that's why you see um, these huge wrecks at Talladega and De- Daytona is because there's just literally no throttle response. You hold this thing wide open, and then you let off the gas because the engine is so starved for, for, for air that there's just no responsiveness in the car to make any kind of maneuvers to get around it. Um, but, you know, they're going, they're going with a new, they're going with um, what they've, what they've had in the past or they've used in the past. Um, <clears throat> so they're, so they're doing what, like I said, they're doing away with the, with the restrictor plate. They're going to do away with that, but they're going to put a tapered spacer in between the, the throttle body and the intake manifold. And what the, what this does is, depending on the size of it, depends on how much horsepower it cuts down in the engine. However, it gives more re- throttle response to the driver themselves to make more maneuvers. Um, while it may bunch the cars up a little bit more, the drivers have a little bit more maneuverability. What they're also going to go with is they're going to go with uh, an 8-inch uh, blade on the back for the spoiler. It's 8 inches by 61 inches. Um, this thing is going to create a massive, massive drag on the car, um, um, similar or more similar to what we see at these high plate tracks. Um, they're also going to go change the radiator pan in the front. They're going to change the splitter in the front. They're going to put duct work into the front. This is all in an effort to put a higher drag on the car to close the field up. With all of this said, I'm not an engineer. I'm not going to play an engineer. I'm not going <laughs> to pretend to be an engineer. I can only you, tell you, you what this stuff does. I can tell you what this stuff does. I can tell you what it is and what and how it works. But I'm not going to try and get into the engineering side <laughs> of it. You mean you don't you get paid engineer? You don't get paid no, engineer no, style? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to well, play an engineer on the phone or on TV. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's uh, kind of get into where we're at now. Uh, obviously, big race in, in Charlotte. One of the things that we talk, that was talked about this week, talking about the Charlotte Raceway, the owner are, is unlikely to add more of what they call rovals. Now, you and I kind of know what that is. Uh, and it, it seemed to have good success last week. And we're going to get into some things about last week, some highlights last week, highlights for that matter. Uh, but uh, talk with us a little bit about what a roll is, the concept behind it. Well, over the last you know number of years, we, we during the late 90s and 2000s, we moved to these one-and-a-half-mile style racetracks. And they're pretty much, as they've been – you know, they've uh, been, uh, you know, nicknamed as cookie cutters. They all look the same. Uh, they pretty much race the same. There may be a little bit of variable between one track versus the other based on its asphalt or its, um, or, or, or its, um, uh, the banking, the degree of banking on the turns. Um, and NASCAR fans have, over the last couple of years or so, said, you know, we want something new. We want, um, we want more road courses. We want more short track. We want something different. We want you to disrupt what is currently going on because we go to the same places every year. We see the same racing every year. We, we want something different. So SMI and NASCAR responded and they built a road course uh, inside of the infield of Charlotte Motor Speedway. And this is the similar concept that Daytona does when they race the Rolex 24. It's a roval. Um, they, they race through a road course on the infield. They use the oval banking on the outsides of the turns, back stretch, and parts of the front stretch. Um, they took the concept from that, and they put stock cars on them. Um, it's about 16, 17 turns when you put it all together using both the infield road course and the oval um, course on the outside. So they've combined both of these together and 
and again, and pretty much the same concept that Daytona has done for for eons with the Rolex 24. So if anybody's familiar with the Rolex 24 and how they race both the infield and on the oval on the outside, that's exactly what Charlotte Motor Speedway did to create the oval uh, in Charlotte. Well, I tell you what, it provided some excitement, that's for sure. Obviously, uh, uh, Kurt Busch says the only explanation for the Charlotte Roval uh, NASCAR uh, race leaders crashing in unison on the late restart was that all of us are just that stupid. BK locked up and slid into the barrier at the corner, nicknamed Heartburn Turn, uh, while leading uh, with six laps to go. Kyle Larson, uh, Bush, Paul Menard, William Byron all followed him and sustained heavy damage. And then, obviously, we know about the huge win from Ryan Blaney getting his first win uh, with Penske. Very monumental win. Recap the action at Charlotte because at the end, yep, there was some action, all right? According to Kurt Busch, we are all just that stupid. (laughs) Well, it's uh, again, most of these drivers have had limited practice or have limited, have been on this course very limited. I don't think it's stupidity, to be honest with you. It's just that these drivers – Somebody said go back and look at when they went to Sears Point back in the 80s, and they'll see the same exact type of racing, the same exact type of access, the same exact type of incidents that occurred throughout the race. And that was due to the fact that this is the first time that they had been on these courses. And while some of these teams had been out on these courses, and they've tested over the last eight to ten months or so, um, it's easy to go and run around there with one or two other guys, but when you put 40 cars on a track and they all try and do the same thing, well, then there's going to be incidents, and we've seen that, and we did see that. Uh, We saw Martin Truex Jr. early in the race spin out. We saw several drivers throughout the race wreck multiple, multiple, multiple times. I mean, Kyle Larson's, I mean, there was, it was completely used up at the end of the day. It looked like it had just finished doing battle at Martinsville. It was destroyed, and in fact, it had to be towed off of Pitt Road because they couldn't move the car anymore. Um, you know, the, the late race incident between Truex and Johnson, um, that, that, that solidified Johnson's um, end of his championship drive here in 2018. Uh, had he finished second and lifted, I think he would have been. And uh, he's gone back and he's uh, recapped and said, you know, if he would have done something different, even finishing second, he would still have a chance in 2018. But you know, those guys were going hard. They were going hard for the win. They both wrecked, and at the end of the day, um, Blaney got Blaney got another win this year. Um, but you know there were some severely damaged cars out there that took a hit in the points. I mean, when you when you have uh, Kyle Busch that had to park it for the day, uh, Brad Keselowski had to park it for the day. Uh, some of these other chase contenders, I mean playoff contenders, had to park it for the day. Uh, it it was a hit for them, and uh, even though they closed the round out, um, you know they they were looking for more points that you know could have helped them going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry. I thought you had something else to say there. Um, so my, uh, let's let's get into Dover. Obviously, we had some weather issues. Uh, Kyle's going to have the pole. The 125 was uh, postponed till today. Looks like uh, maybe the weather is cooperating from what I'm seeing somewhat so far. Uh, hopefully, they didn't pull the Indianapolis uh, chapter out of what happened here at Brickyard Weekend because it was a total mess. Uh, but uh, talk with us about Dover and the Monster Mile and how this uh, chase points is, is stacking up and uh, who are we watching and who's – who who uh, who's in and who's not in? We'll put it that way. Well, I I don't <clears throat> excuse me. I don't think that there's you know too many drivers right now that can sit uh, and afford to sit around too much longer. I mean, we're really honestly coming to the end of this. I'm looking at some drivers towards you know the back of this thing, like Alex Bowen or you know Kyle Larson took a heck of a hit this weekend. That uh, you know if he if he can't get something together in the next couple of races. He may come on, he may win at, at Dover this week, and, you know, I, th- I think he'll be okay. Um, but there's some other drivers, I think, within the top eight or so that uh, uh, Clint Boyer, I think he can't sit and wait around too much longer. He's sitting fourth in points right now. Too too many bad hits could knock him down a little bit. 
Um, Ryan Blaney, by even though his virtue of his win, he's sitting right there on the cusp of in or out, you know, tied right now um, <clears throat> with uh, Chase Elliott. And I think some of these drivers, it, it's now a point where they have to go or, you know, they're going to be left behind, unfortunately. So this weekend, it, it's, you know, we, we get to go to a concrete racetrack. Tires sometimes play an a, a play a role into this, but not so much this time of year where it's cooler now. Um, they're going to get some rubber down on this track early today. You know, well, I think right now with the K&N series are running. Um, but it's a very fast track. It's a high bank track coming off turn two. It can ruin your day pretty, pretty quickly out there because that track closes up. You get these nice wide racetracks around the turns, but you hit turn two coming off that down back stretch. It, 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 it you know, it really um, gets really small coming through there. And we've seen a lot of incidences down the back that have ended a lot of people's day. Um, as far as well, Dover is concerned, it's, go, go ahead. No, I was going to say, they don't call it the Monster Mile for nothing, and as you go, as you go into the track there in Dover, you'll, you're greeted by a huge stone monster statue just eating up race cars, so uh, absolutely, that, that's for sure. Go ahead, and uh, final final points there, uh, sir, uh, for today's race, and, and uh, uh, who's your prediction, and what are your thoughts? Oh, I I think that you know you know Jimmy Johnson has Jimmy Johnson unfortunately has you know on this fifty plus race win, uh, winless streak and I think he's uh you know he's he's looking for something to happen um you know he's won multiple times there at Dover in the past I think he's going to put on a good show this weekend I think he's got nothing to prove at this point so other than going out there and trying to break that winless streak I think this is a place where he could potentially do that at. Um, based on his previous record there. Otherwise, I would look at a Kyle Larson or somebody like that that needs to improve upon their days. These tracks seem to play into his hand. Um, and I, I think those are the two right now you got to look at. Well, we'll certainly be uh, watching it, and certainly as the as – the, uh, uh... As season winds down, we'll be having you on breaking down uh, the championship as we get ever so closer uh, to it as we be begin the month of October. Uh, Steve, where can people find you working your masterpieces, sir? You can follow me on Twitter at Speedway Digest, Facebook.com forward slash Speedway Digest, and Speedway Digest.com. Steve Wilson, we appreciate you joining us, and uh, we'll see what happens there today in Dover. Thanks a lot. You guys take care. Thanks. Steve Wilson, our official NASCAR contributor, and we're back on the air with some NASCAR. It's been a few weeks, it seems like, uh, just because of a lot of different issues and situations. Uh, thank you to Matthew Embry, uh, breaking down some college football action uh, for us at the beginning of the hour. Join us in the balance green room here in just a moment. Rick Riggin, executive producer of the balance, going to break down some NFL action. We'll get some a uh, little bit of uh, Notre Dame talk from him and uh, – and uh, we'll, we'll see what else uh, we can get him to, to chirp about. My name is Tom Mark Michelle Presidente. This is the Balance Radio Network. We'll be right back. Tonight, I just want to take you away. So you're in the midst of time. Let's take this party all right. The Air National Guard is a reserve component of the United States Air Force and serves alongside active duty Air Force members in times of a national crisis. In addition, the Air Guard serves the state and local community in a wide range of capacities. The reason people join the Air Guard is as diverse as our members and includes such reasons as a deep desire to serve their country, money for college, travel, new job skills, and the pride that goes along with belonging to the greatest military organization in the world. I joined because I felt a calling to serve my country, but I didn't want to be far away from my family, so the Indiana Air National Guard was a perfect fit for me. With over 95 different career opportunities to choose from and 100% paid college tuition to any state-funded college, why not give us a call? Call 1-800-841-3103 or visit online at goang.com to find out more. Again, that's 1-800-841-3103. The Air National Guard, guarding America, defending freedom. 
It's double trouble, double the fun. At African Safari Wildlife Park in Port Clinton, Ohio. See the largest antelope on Earth. The